I really rejoiced in the thought this year that I could preach a Pentecost sermon on Pentecost Sunday because at Fort Payne, we had a special service that always seemed to end up on Pentecost Sunday or Pentecost Sunday always ended up on days we had special services. So I could not tell you how many years it's been that I actually preached a Pentecost sermon on Pentecost Sunday. Look forward to that, enjoyed that. But what I found is that instead of allowing me to go to my next sermon series, God just kind of began to stir in my heart. No, nope, we got a little more work to do here. So last Sunday, we did the second sermon in a one-part sermon series on the message of Pentecost, where Peter preaches to the crowd, and, and by the grace and love of God, 3,000 souls were added to the church. What a great celebration that was. What a great harvest of souls that was for the kingdom of God, as we read there in Acts chapter 2. So then last Sunday, when we finished with that, my, my thoughts are, okay, what about next Sunday? And, and I had nothing for next Sunday except just a little inkling inside, a little, a little something I could not get rid of. And the thing that was on my heart and mind last Sunday and, and, and the first few days of the week was the people who did not come to Christ on Pentecost Sunday. I thought, wow, what a, a great sermon, a great message, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people come to faith, but we know by the wording of that chapter, there were also others there who did not come to faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them, as a matter of fact, were mocking Peter and the disciples, saying they were full of new wine, they were drunk early in the day, and uh, that was not the case. Oh, they were drunk, but it wasn't on wine, they were full of the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us, be not drunk with wine as in dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what was going on that day. But, but I still, the early part of the week, I thought about those people who had not come to faith in Christ on this great day of, of Pentecost. And when you read in Acts chapter 3 and 4, those chapters following Acts chapter 2, we find that the work of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not fully accomplished in Acts chapter 2. What we find as we continue to read throughout the book of Acts, is that the outpouring continues. And people are yet again filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And God does mighty works in and through the church as the church is filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Jesus talked about in Acts chapter 1. He told them to stay in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit of God coming to empower them to do what? To be witnesses of Jesus Christ to the uttermost ends of the earth. And God continues that work today, even through the church which you and I are a part of today, is, is the church that Jesus continues to work in and through as he does the church all over the face of the earth. So we want to talk about this morning, the outpouring continues with a focus on boldness. We want to think about how boldness is very present in the ministry of the early church, in particular, Peter's ministry and Peter and John's ministry together. Now, I want to read Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. Then I want to share a story with you, and then I want to share some things God has laid on my heart and mind to share with you today. So Acts chapter 3, verse number 1, New King James Version. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, Look at us! So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was the 
It was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I was serving my first appointment, Providence United Methodist Church. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to travel back to Carrollton where I grew up uh, for some family business or something of that nature. I can't remember exactly uh, what the reason for going to Carrollton was. But while I was in Carrollton, I had determined and planned to stop by and visit with my grandfather on my mother's side. Uh, William Deese uh, was his name. We called him Papa Deese. And uh, people who knew him well re referred to him as Bill. He was probably the greatest spiritual influence or one of the greatest spiritual influences in my life as a child. We went to church together, so I grew up being around Papa Deese. Every, su every other Sunday after church, we went over to his house and he and, and uh, Mama Deese and, and some aunts and all would cook dinner and we'd all eat dinner and have a great time there. And I remember those years growing up. Paul Baldis was never at a shortage of words to say about Jesus. I mean, he was one of the boldest witnesses for Jesus I've ever been around. Whether it's at church or, or at home or in the community, he always had something good to say about Jesus and always wanted to share that with other people. So I wanted to stop by and visit with him just to see how he was doing. I hadn't seen him in a while. But I had a request that I, I wanted to share with him. And that was that he would pray a prayer of blessing over me as his grandson, but also as a pastor in the United Methodist Church. If you look back in the Old Testament, you see grandfathers would bless the sons and the grandsons uh, with a beautiful, wonderful blessing. And as I go back and I read those blessings in the Old Testament, uh, I would think, wow, I would love for that to happen in my life. So I stopped by with the intention of asking Papa Aldis to pray one of those blessings over me. So I, I, I arrived there at the nursing home that day, and I found his room, and I told him who I was. His sight had begun to dim a little bit, as did his hearing, but he was still very sharp in mind. I said, Papa Deese, this is uh, Ricky, your grandson. I'm Elsie's son, youngest son. And he said, no, you're not. He just ate me. He laughed all the time. I said, yes, I am. No, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. He said, oh, how you doing? How you doing? So we got to talking a little bit. And he's probably like almost 90 years old and just, just a joyful, wonderful guy. And I said, Papa, how do you like being here at the nursing home? And he said, I love it, which was not what I expected to hear. And I said, after a, <laughs> after a pregnant pause, I said, why do you love it? And he said, because there's people here that don't know Jesus. And I said, really? And he said, yes, this place is full of people that don't know Jesus so I get to go around the nursing home and tell people about Jesus. Some of them respond. Some of them tell me to go away. I invite them to church. Some of them come. Some of them don't. And, and I've just got a mission field here. And I thought, wow, this guy is almost 90 years old. And he's spending his last years in the nursing home. And he's found new life and new ministry in a mission field at the nursing home. And I mean, I was just blown away at his optimism and his excitement about being in ministry there in the nursing home. So we kind of celebrated that for a little while, and I said, I said, Papa, I've got a prayer I would love for you to pray for me. And I told him about those uh, blessings in the Old Testament. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know those. I remember those. Those are wonderful. And I said, Papa, I wondered if you'd pray one of those blessings over me. Uh, I'm pastoring a church now, and, you know, I just want God to work in and through me to be a great pastor and to be a great husband, a great father and all like that. He said, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to. So my grandfather, probably about 90 years old at the time, he is sitting on the edge of the bed. He gets off the bed and he kneels down on the floor on his knees. So I, I see what he's doing and I kneel down beside him on the floor and he begins to pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just love you and we praise you today and just thank you for Ricky and the call of ministry on his life and Father, I just ask you to give him boldness to preach your word. Yes, yes, Father, I ask you to give him boldness to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And I thought, where's the rest? Where's the fireworks and the bells and whistles? Where's the prayer for thousands to come to Christ? Miracles, <coughs> signs and wonders and things like that. I said, where's the rest? And to be honest with you, I was kind of disappointed in his prayer. 
because I was young and dumb back then. But since then, I have come to realize the power and the importance of Holy Spirit boldness. Now, not ignorant, rude, obnoxious boldness. Anybody can do that. But I'm talking about Holy Spirit boldness that really ministers to a heart and life and can change a heart and life for eternity. Holy Spirit boldness. And as we see the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit continue in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, that is one of the things we also see is Holy Spirit boldness at work in the hearts and lives and words and actions of people like Peter and John and the other disciples there in the early church. It was with great boldness that Peter preached that Pentecost sermon on the day of Pentecost and boldness would continue to be a part of his life and ministry. Not natural boldness. We know of many occasions in the Gospels where Peter very boldly jumped up and spoke only to speak the wrong thing at the wrong time or the wrong thing at the right time. I don't know. It was not, it did not end well. But now, under the inspiration, the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter's boldness is changing hearts and lives. So there's three avenues of boldness I want us to think about for a few minutes this morning. Holy Spirit gives us boldness to minister. Holy Spirit gives us boldness to speak or to share our witness. Holy Spirit gives us boldness to pray. So now, Holy Spirit gives us boldness to minister. I just love Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, where this lame man at the gate called Beautiful is wonderfully healed by the power of God. I just love this story. I just hope one day, if God is willing... I could look at somebody and say, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus, and then boom, whatever their need is, God would pour through me into that person and give them more than they ever asked for in the first place. I just love this scene. Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. It's a good thing to pray, amen? They're going about the Lord's business, doing what God had called and gifted them to do. And they want to go to prayer to be empowered and in tune with the Spirit to fulfill that same Spirit-given ministry. So off they go. They probably traveled a similar path as they have traveled in the past. And they probably saw a similar guy, the man who always was laying at the gate called Beautiful, again this day. You know, they could have walked by as he held up his little cup or, or said, alms, alms. You know, they could have walked on by. They could have said, well, God bless you. I don't have any money today, but I'll pray for you when I get in the temple. God bless you. How many times have you driven down the road and you saw that person begging and you drove right on by? Or how many times did you stop and offer them a five, a ten, offer to get them some food, or offer to minister to their need? Well, on this day, Peter and John are walking by the man, lame from his mother's womb, laid there by the gate called Beautiful, and God decides to do something wonderful. I, I can just imagine Holy Spirit gripping Peter's heart, making him kind of stand up and pay attention. There's the lame man. I want you to heal him today. And Peter going, oh, why haven't we thought about that in the past? You know, in, Ma in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sent them out and told them to preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, raise the dead. I mean, wow, look at the things Jesus empowered them to do under his ministry. Now they have Holy Spirit empowerment as well. I don't remember anywhere in the gospel account or in the book of Acts that Jesus told them to stop healing. So here he is, Peter and John. Here's the man lame from his mother's womb. Peter stops. Holy Spirit begins to move inside. He says, look at us. And that guy looks up, expecting to receive something. But you know what? God gave him more than he ever expected that day. God healed him. He just wanted a few coins to help with his living. On this day, God would give him new legs and feet so he could go make a living. Isn't that wonderful today? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. 
rise up and walk. And Peter put action to his words. He didn't just say it. He stuck out his hand and he grabbed the man by the right hand. And he began to pull. He expected God to do something in that moment. And God did. God honored Peter's faith as Peter honored the prompting and the moving of the Holy Spirit inside of him to speak up, to speak out, to be bold, to minister to this man in a fresh and a new and a powerful and a wonderful way, a body-changing way, but more importantly, a life-changing way. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And that's exactly what the man did. God wanted to give this man something more than he was asking to receive. And God gave him more than he asked for through that Holy Spirit boldness in Peter and John that day. Did you notice? He didn't ask to be healed, but God healed him anyway. Isn't God good? Did you notice that after he was healed, he got up and he walked around and he leaped and he praised God? Nobody had to teach him how to walk. He's never taken a step in his life. Nobody had to teach him how to walk. When God does something, he does it right, doesn't he? When God or Jesus would would heal or restore the mute, they never took speech lessons. They just started talking. When God healed the lame man through Peter and John, they didn't have to teach him to walk. He could even leap. He could shout. He praised God. With every breath he had inside himself. Now this morning when you woke up and you put your feet on the floor and you stood up with strength in your ankles and your feet and your legs, did you jump and praise God like that? We don't praise God for the blessings we receive every day. But this man did because he had not had that blessing in his life in the past. But now God had tremendously blessed him and he praised God with all that he had. He shouted and praised God. I learned something in seminary. At least one thing. That was three years of my life, and at least I learned one thing. We used to be called the shouting Methodists. Did you know that? We used to be called, I emphasize, used to be called the shouting Methodist. Why? Because we gave God the praise and the glory that He deserved for the blessings that we've received in our life. The blessing of salvation, shoes to put on your feet, food to put in your belly, protection over yourself and your family, a home to live in, neighbors to love and to love you, a church in which to worship and serve in and through. They shouted because the Holy Spirit was mightily with them and they acknowledged the blessings of life that they enjoyed each and every day. Why do we have to be denied something before we'll praise God for it when we finally receive it? I'm not sure, but we need to do a little bit better. So he's jumping up and down in church. He's shouting in church. And what happens when somebody's jumping up and down and shouting in church? It draws the crowd. What's going on in here? I'm hearing shouting outside. I'm seeing this guy jump up and down and run around. What's going on here? And I could just kind of see Peter with a little smile on his face. Uh, I'm so glad you asked. I'm just so glad you asked. And, and, he, and Peter tells us, or Luke tells us what Peter says here in Acts chapter 3. Uh, verse number 11. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness he made, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, whom God granted from the dead, of which we are witnesses, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. 
and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance, as also did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Now, I want to tell you, that's bold preaching right there. That's bold speaking right there. Peter is again talking to the people responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and pretty much saying, you did it. Now, it cost Jesus his life. And it could cost Peter his, and it will later on in life. But he says, you did it. But then he doesn't stop there. He says in verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Yes, you did it, but God wants you to forgive you of it. God wants to set you free from it. And God has healed this guy to get your attention so I can preach to you the good news, the truth of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior so that you too, just like us, can repent of your sins and enjoy this newness of life that only Jesus brings. So God, through the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, gave Peter and John boldness to minister. And now, Holy Spirit has given Peter and John, Peter in particular, boldness to preach the good news, boldness to speak, boldness to witness to the love and the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. And again, when you do things like that, sometimes it gets you in trouble. But on this day, the Bible says in chapter 4, verse number 4, the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So in another sermon, another work and move of God, 2,000 more people were added to God's spiritual family, God's kingdom. Why? Because Peter and John were willing to just receive the fullness of the Spirit, the boldness of the Spirit, and act upon that same empowering of the presence of God within them. Boldness to minister, boldness to witness. But in just a few moments, they're going to take that boldness to prayer. So they're in trouble. Because the religious leaders didn't like the celebration that was going on at the temple. And they said, okay, bring them, Peter and John and the man who's been healed, to us, to the Sanhedrin. Let us examine them. And they did. And Peter yet again told them to their face, you did it. But guess what? God wants to save you as well. They just weren't in, interested in salvation that day. They threatened Peter. They said, if you keep speaking in his name, trouble's coming your way. Do not preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Do not speak anymore about the resurrection of this guy you call our Lord and Savior, the Messiah. Don't do it. I mean, what else could they do? The man who was healed, who had been lame since being born, stood right there as they said, it's the name of Jesus that made this man whole. So all they could do is say, don't do it again, don't do it again, don't do it again. And I love the words of Peter who looks at them and says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So Holy Spirit was bold there in them to speak of the things they had seen and heard. But now they let them go and they go back to the church here gathered together in their day in chapter number 4, verse number 23 and following. And they decide, like good Methodists, we need to pray. That's how you know they were good Methodists. They prayed a lot, right? There you go, there you go. And God moved when they prayed. But one of the things I love about their prayer is not just what they prayed for, but what they didn't pray for. You know, they didn't go before God and say, Oh, Lord, you've heard their threats. Please soothe them, calm them, take away their anger so they won't persecute us anymore. They didn't pray that. Oh, God, give us favor with the Sanhedrin, with the religious leaders, with the Roman leadership. Give us favor so they won't persecute us anymore. They didn't pray that. You know what they prayed? Basically, God, do it again. Do it again. Do it one more time. Listen to their prayer. Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? 
The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now listen to what they're praying. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What did they say? What did they pray? God, do it again. God, give us boldness again to proclaim your word by stretching out your hand to heal again that signs and wonders may be done again in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And God honored and answered their prayer. When's the last time you prayed a prayer like that? God, I, I, I suffered today. They ridiculed me. They made fun of me because of my faith in Jesus Christ. God, can I go back to work tomorrow and do it again? Can I go back to the community center tomorrow and do it again? Can I talk to my neighbor tomorrow and do it again? You're praying for that Holy Spirit boldness that will empower you to minister boldly, to speak and witness boldly, and to pray boldly. God, let's do it again. God, let's see hearts and lives changed again. To His glory and our blessing. Amen? Amen. We have a hymn of response this morning uh, that we would invite you to join with us as we sing hymn number 348, Softly.